I'm going to introduce Tom Sue to you now. Uh, when I asked Tom what was the most important thing about his biography, he said, I'm a teacher. So, Tom Sue, teacher from MIT. Good morning. I'm going to connect up some of my technology here. And like all teachers, I'm going to pray that it works. Um, I want to thank you, David, for setting up such a wonderful launch of some of the ideas we want to talk about. Because my background. I am a teacher. I've taught every grade from fourth grade through I taught at MIT, so I taught plasma physics. And my, what I want to talk about is that we need to change how we teach to reach the 21st century, which is not just what we teach, but how. Um, I worked for another company, two companies, Eastman, Kodak, and Xerox in the United States, both of which followed the same path as Nokia. They thought they were the best. They stopped watching the world and they became history. My research had to do with fusion energy, which is the future of, of energy. I've also taught, like I said, at many different grades, and I believe that those who stand in front of children every day are probably the best qualified to know how do we excite those children about what we do. And I spent the last 25 years developing curriculum, the last 15 trying to figure out how do we take a textbook, a static thing from the past, and make it into a living digital curriculum which will reach students and excite them with new ways of learning? And not just swiping to turn the page, but open up new ways of learning. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. And so, for example, if you took a mechanic from 1918 and you put them in front of this, they're not going to know how to fix it. But if you take a classroom from 1930 and you look at the same classroom today, it looks the same. There is a digital projector, but the teaching and learning methods tend to be the same. And that's where we would like to do something more. Because those teaching and learning methods, if they were working and the students were excited, that would be fine. But they're not always working. And so. I was asked to talk about what, is, what does 21st century skills mean to me? Well, it means that whatever talents every child has, our schools need to provide them a path for their personal success at whatever they are good at. And in their success, we ensure the success of our culture, our planet, and our understanding of the universe and ourselves. And this is maybe different for different students, and in fact, it is. So let me go back to elementary school for a minute. How many of you remember having to learn this? <laughs> you know, there's, there's many steps of this. Um, I still remember this. And but as I'm doing this, how many of you have used this outside of a classroom? A few. Excellent. <laughs> When I was at Eastman Kodak Company, we had a prize. If you could use calculus in your job as an engineer, you got the prize. In three years I was there, we only did it once. Now, that is an important skill, but the algorithm that students memorize is not as important as why does it work? Because a, a computer cannot draw those same little figures. The computer's not going to draw this. But the successive subtraction of numbers, a computer can do. And if we were to teach the students how to write a simple program to do this, to subtract numbers and count how many times one number goes into another, now we've taught them a 21st century skill, how to use the knowledge and apply it into a new area. And so 
there are many things we would like kids to take away, and in some ways I'm going to focus on science, but I'm going to use science as a way of developing critical thinking skills. In some sense, it's the context in which we teach our children to think. Because learning to think is the most important of all things. Because our children are going to have to solve the world's problems that, yes, we made many of them. <laughs> but we're leaving it up to our children to solve very complex problems on population explosion, on global warming, on the oceans becoming acidic, on many such things. And they're not in a book. And so let me go to a, an idea. An idea from physics, this one is about force. It's hard to start learning about physics. Most of us learned about force doing worksheets. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up one of my toys for a second. I'm a science teacher, so I have toys. I like toys. So I'm now going to, we're going to switch to my laptop for a minute. This particular toy allows me to measure force. If I push inwards, the force is positive. If I pull outwards, the force is negative. So it measures compression and tension. And so when I teach the children how to do force, their textbook, the way they have to learn, if it has a tool like this where I can see and measure the force, and then a true 21st century skill means I take this thing, and as David said, I make it relevant. I make it important. I put this sensor in this bridge that I built, and then I put the bridge and then I put force on the bridge, and I see how does the force on the bridge change? Where is the force greatest? Let me go back to my slides. And so I take this idea, and I look at a bridge, and the bridge has forces in it, but the forces are invisible. I know that they're there, but they're not, you cannot see them. I need a tool to make them visible because... Our brains, the children's brains of children, are most adept at recognizing visual and learning from real situations. And so we measure these forces, and then we actually build a bridge. The students make this bridge, and then they put the sensor in different places, and they try to come up with an idea. How do I explain the forces in the bridge? That's a 21st century method of learning, to take a concept that we need to teach embed it in an activity that has direct relevance using a technology that will teach the students how to use the technologies they're likely to see in the real world. So there are, if we, find, if we do this, we find out that the br a bridge, the top part of the bridge is in compression and the bottom part is in tension. If I push this down, these squeeze together. And so when you look at a truss bridge, you'll find that the heaviest pieces of the bridge are on the top, not the bottom, because materials tend to fail in compression before tension. Okay, and so in order to come up with the idea, the explanation, that's where creativity comes in. Creativity is where ideas come from. It's not just about art and music. It's about where are the ideas that explain things? And so there are, of course, lots of other ways to learn about bridges. Um, we knew about bridges a long time ago. I'm going to play a little cartoon here. I'll read this to you. Little child says, how do they know the load limit on bridges? Because if you go to a bridge, there's a sign, load limit, 10,000 kilograms. And the little boy, the, de the father says, they drive bigger and bigger trucks over the bridge, okay, until it breaks. Then they rebuild the bridge the same way, and they write down the weight of the last truck that made it over. <laughs> and they put it on the sign. <laughs> and the child's mother says, dear, if you didn't know the answer, I wish you wouldn't make it up. But the truth is, that is exactly how we learned to build bridges. We didn't calculate them in the beginning. We built them, and we observed what happened. That took 2,000 years to figure out how to build bridges. OK, you have 45 minutes. We can't take 2,000 years. That's why we develop tools like this. Famous physicist named Richard Feynman once was asked, if all scientific knowledge was destroyed and you could save one fact, just one, what would it be? His answer was, it would be the existence of atoms because so much of our understanding of the natural world is based on understanding atoms. Okay? So... 
this is from the grade nine teaching standard. Okay. Students will understand how the macroscopic properties of matter, such as pressure and temperature, come from atoms. Okay. So how am I going to teach this? I cannot see the atoms. The children cannot see the atoms. 50 years ago, most people did not know what an atom was, including most adults in science and most teachers, and yet now we expect a grade six student to understand this. So how? Okay, so I'm going to go back to my little toy again here. Can you switch back to my laptop? Let's stop this. So I have another little toy here. I have a syringe with some nothing in it. And if I push this, if I push on the nothing, something pushes back. But there's nothing in here. If I pull on the nothing, something pulls it back. But there's nothing in here. How do we explain how nothing can make a force? Think like you're a child. Well, the way we do this is I'm going to go to one of my textbooks now. It happens to be one in chemistry. This is a chemistry textbook, but it's an online textbook because it does things when we study gases. I'm going to open up this little Im simulation of this. And so I'm going to take this. Let me close it again. Uh, I'm going to take out, this is something interesting, this is not, we're having some problems with our technology. I'm going to pull that, I'm going to pull the plunger out. I'm going to let those little balls fill up the center. I'm going to put the plunger back, the stopper back in. I'm going to push this back in. Now, do you understand how atoms might push, make a force that pushes back by watch, playing with this? What happens is I squeeze it all the little atoms get much closer together and they push back, they get all excited. And that's the cause of pressure. One of the things we really want to understand is that we need better teaching tools. You can go back to my slides, please. We need better kinds of curriculum to make this work, to make solid, liquid, and gas to explain this. You know, the same type of stuff that's in water that I drank this morning, if I separate the atoms into oxygen and hydrogen, I have an explosive gas, which is very different from the water. A good curriculum is an interaction between teaching, the natural world, things we do, and a curriculum that integrates those things. And a 21st century curriculum has got to be, have enough technology to make the difficult things we have to teach learnable by students. Another one, all students have to learn about the graph of motion. This is something that's on all the PISA exams in grade 10. How? Let me give you an example. This is a graph that's on the test. Let me explain what most students think this graph means. I have a little car with wheels. Most students think this graph means I go along here. Actually, I should do it this way because I'm going to go this way. I go along here. I go up a hill. I cross the top. I go down. I go down into a valley, and I do this. Right? That's how most students think this graph means. They don't notice that the axis on the left is position. Let me go back to my laptop for a second. And so let me switch myself to this little car here. I'm going to look at a graph of position. I'm going to take my little car. Whoops, I should turn my little car on first. Let's turn that off. Let's turn my car back on. And with modern technologies, these little cars, are all, all these little things are wireless, so they connect up to the, whatever the students have. In this case, I have a laptop. And so I have a graph here that I'm going to make this graph 
the position of my car in centimeters. Okay, my car is going here. I'm going to make the car go forward. I'm going to make it come back to where I started. I'm going to make it go backward. And I'm going to make it come back to where I started. Okay, what did the car do? Did it go up and down a hill? No, it went back and forth. By making the car go back and forth and me, the student, making the graph, this is how I learn what it means. Can I go back to my slides, please? Okay, because all graphs tell a story, and the story is what happened as time went on. And so this actual graph, by making the graph themselves, the students can actually tell the story. And what did the car really do? It went forward, it stopped, it went back to the start, it went backward, it stopped again. The old way to do this with paper and pencil was one thing, but the new way, a 21st century way, is to use tools and technology so that students can directly interact with nature. And so, I'm going to skip through some of this. I want to think, say that as you develop curriculum, and this is what I do, I try to take, I've spent my life making ideas practical to teach in a classroom. Is the first thing, identify what it is we're trying to teach very clearly. We're trying to teach the graph of motion, of position. Second is to create a strategy for achieving the goal of learning that. And third, to create an assessment, some way of knowing that whatever we did, they learned what we intended. These are good principles by which to design curriculum. Now, this idea of acceleration, by the way, which we have to teach to, to, to elementary school students, is not an easy idea. It took almost 2,000 years between Aristotle and Newton, and neither, none of those were dumb people. But Galileo did not understand it, neither did Aristotle. And yet, you know, we have to teach this idea in 45 minutes. And so uh, one of the other 21st century skills, which I don't have time to talk about, is using technology like spreadsheets to make models of things that we measure so that kids can use real tools to investigate nature. I am writing the national curriculum for the country of Qatar right now. They've, they have had the courage to say, we're going to teach an integrated science, technology, mathematics, and engineering to our students all at the same time, and we're going to put the pieces together, as David suggested. Make it integrated. And so um, part of this was using, teaching the students how to use modern tools, like spreadsheets, to make their own models of things. So I would like to say, just this may sound silly, but if you want what a car does, you buy a car. You don't buy a boat and put wheels on it. If you want to teach science, you need to have special tools that are designed to teach science. You don't take a book that was printed in 1600 and assume that that can teach the students 21st century things. So I want to end up with one, with well, a very quick I, last little thing about how do we control our machines? And then this is my closing idea, and that is, you know, for 10,000 years we controlled our machines with, uh, with muscles. You pushed on the plow. For about 100 years, we started using switches to control things once we invented electricity. And then we had, anybody here remember punch cards? <laughs> Learning to program computers on cards. I taught, I taught a Fortran course at Boston University in the 70s with punch cards. Most of us grew up, we got to the mouse and the screen. And today, you say, Alexa, turn on the light and people expect the light to go on. How did we get there? And how do we recognize each other? It turns out that sound is one of the most intimate of the human senses. It's how we tell each other apart. Can I have my laptop back again for a second? I'm gonna put this little chemistry thing away and do something Okay, this is, this is a, te a textbook on physics. 
And one of the things I can do in this book is I can make sounds. And as I make these sounds, if I turn up and down this sound attached to have a frequency of 450 hertz, you can hear that independent of all the others. Why is that? Our ears are very good detectors of sound. Let me turn these back off. Let me actually open up another little toy here, which allows me to actually see the sound. So you are seeing the sound in my voice, the wave of my voice. This allows me to show the frequencies in my voice. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> in fact, this is a, the frequency spectrum is a very interesting way to talk about what is noise and what is music. Because if I make a noisy sound, it looks like that. If I make a, a musical sound, it looks like that. There is a very big difference in the structure of how the sound works. And if I talk to people, this graph here will show me on the vertical, it's showing me frequency. La, on the horizontal, it's showing me time. If I say something, Sally says snowflakes, okay? This here, these frequencies of sound represent the words, and this little high frequency band here is the sound of a letter S. And some, that's how a computer understands sound. It must measure all the frequencies and then figure out what are the patterns that are actually words. Can I have my slides back? Okay. And so because our ear takes all those complicated noises and then breaks them up to each individual frequency of sound, just like your eye takes all the dots and makes a picture, your ear takes all the frequencies of sound and makes a picture of the sound. And that is where the meaning is. And so we can play with this by having students make their own sounds. They can understand differences, for example, between a male and a female voice, different frequencies of sound and how a computer can understand a word and make meaning out of it from taking the sound and mapping it into a word. Again, 21st century education, if we think about what are our goals, the things our students need to know and understand today are vastly greater than they were even 50 years ago. That we need more ways to make the learning effective that use technology from the 21st century. And even difficult ideas, such as the molecular explanation of pressure, those ideas can be learned, even by young students. But they cannot be learned using just a paper, a pencil, and a book. I mean, I actually like books. I'm a, like David said, I'm an analog person, too. I go to the bookstore when I go to an airport, and I buy a paper book because I like to read them. And so I've been writing these since for 25 years. But I know that this alone is not enough anymore. And so I want to thank you all and leave you with the thinking of how can we use some of the new technology to take our kids up to the 21st century. Thank you.